Welcome, and thank you for tuning into our talk today on Growing the Pie, how great companies deliver both purpose and profit. About three years ago, I was at a pivotal moment in my life, deciding on whether to do an MBA and eager to learn what makes companies great. Uh, I decided to join Leadership Force, where I met Alex. Alex has since challenged me to look for purpose in everything that I do, and I believe the perspective he has on purposeful business will inspire us um, all at Google. Also, Ronan will be um, hosting and moderating some of the questions um, and pick Alex's brain on how we can leverage some of his thinking. Thank you, uh, Jonathan. Um, so again, on behalf of Google, a very warm welcome to you, Alex. Uh, delighted to have you join us today uh, and excited to hear about what you're going to teach us. But just before we move on to that, uh, it would be remiss of me not to recognize that today is actually Jonathan's birthday. And um, uh, so we, we won't break into song just now, but do want to wish Jonathan a very happy birthday. Very good of you to uh, help put this together uh, on a day when uh, you really should be celebrating yourself. But Alex, turning back over to you, and I think the format for today is uh, we're going to invite you to speak for half an hour or so, and then uh, invite the audience to uh, join in with some Q&A uh, for about 20 minutes after that. Um, but the topic of your new book of growing the pie and uh, businesses, leading businesses with purpose is, I think, very a fascinating topic, uh, one that's very pertinent at this moment, uh, and one that I think uh, is certainly on the minds of any of the leaders that I'm talking to right now. Uh, the world seems to be in a very chaotic state. Uh, we're all trying to figure our way through the uncertainty, and whether that's economic or political or otherwise. And uh, our pop the people we serve, our teams of employees, our customers, our users in Google's case, are often looking for the purpose behind uh, what we're trying to do. Now, Google has always led with purpose. Uh, we have a very clear mission statement, which has stayed at the core of who we are since the beginning of time, to organize the world's information and make it universally accessible and useful, and we've added to everyone. But very often, when you're in the trenches and doing your day-to-day -day job, um, it's sometimes difficult to find and recognize where you connect into that greater purpose. So I know that myself as a leader and all of our colleagues across Google are going to be very interested to hear what you have to tell us today. So with that, I'm going to hand over the floor to you and look forward to uh, discussing in more detail at the end. Well, thanks so much, Ronan. Thank you, Jonathan, for this invitation and for this great opportunity to share my thoughts with everybody. So what I hope to speak about over the next half hour is the criticality of purpose. So we often believe that purpose is important so that a company serves wider society. But surprisingly, purpose is also important just for the long term commercial success of a company. So it's not just something which is worthy and nice to have. It's urgent and fundamental. I think an important place to start is to define what purpose is, because we often hear the word purpose and we often assume we know what purposeful business is. But I might actually have a quite different view of purpose to what we typically think of. And to do this, um, I'm going to give an example. I'll take you on a little bit of a journey. And while we're all in our home offices somewhere, uh, let me take you on a journey outside your home offices around the world. So I'm going to take you to the Great Rift valley. So this stretches across two continents and 6,000 kilometers from Lebanon and Asia to Mozambique in Africa. It has some of the world's highest mountains, but it also has some of the world's deepest lakes. And one of these lakes is a lake called Lake Magadi, which is in the Kenyan stretch of the Great Rift Valley. Now you might think it's hard to imagine that I'm here because I've not been here before, but you might have seen this lake before. Maybe not on the small screen of your laptop, but on the big screen of a movie theater. It was featured in The Constant Gardener based on the John Le Carré novel of the same name. And indeed, probably millions of people around the world have seen this lake because they've seen the movie. But fewer than a thousand people have called this lake their home. And one of these people is a gentleman called Emmanuel Saronga, and he makes a living selling and herding goats. Now, for Emmanuel, it used to be 
that cash was king. So when he sold a goat, he would receive cash. He then checked that cash in case it was forged. He'd have to store that cash and worry about being robbed. And then to bank that cash, it wasn't just a trip down the high street. He had to walk for one day to the nearest bank. So his life was really tough. He couldn't graze his goats on the greenest pastures. He had to make sure he was within one day of a bank. But all of this changed thanks to what I would view was a purposeful business. And that business is Vodafone. So as some of you might know, in 2007, Vodafone launched M-Pesa, which is a mobile money service in Kenya. Let me take a few seconds to explain what mobile money is, because we often think it's mobile banking, right? I have a Barclays bank account. I can operate it on my phone rather than going to the branch. But actually, for mobile money, you don't even need a bank account to begin with. And that's really powerful because many Kenyans did not have access to the banking system. So this transformed Emmanuel's life. He no longer needs to worry about cash or forgery or robbery. He can graze his goats where he wants to. And he also has a record of every transaction on his phone, so his accounting is easy. And I don't want to just over-extrapolate from one story, but there was a study by some MIT professors which found that within the first seven years of the launch of M-Pesa, 200,000 households got lifted out of poverty. And importantly, many of these households were headed by women. It allowed them to move from agriculture into business and retail. So this had a huge effect on gender parity. Okay, so that's one example I'd like to give you about Vodafone. But let me tell you a quite different story. And this different story surrounds tax. So in 2012, Vodafone became the first telecoms company around the world to release a tax transparency report showing how much tax they were paying to governments worldwide. And that's obviously important in any company with a lot of intellectual property. You could choose to locate it in low tax jurisdictions. So I've got two questions for everybody um, viewing this to think about. So the first question is, which of these decisions created most value for society? The second question is which of these decisions, if it had not been taken, would have led to the most public outrage or worsened Vodafone's corporate social responsibility, rating or reputation? And I'm pretty sure that most people would agree with the answers to these questions. So which decision created most value for society? It was the first one, right? By launching M-Pesa, Vodafone lifted 200,000 households out of poverty and contributed to gender parity. But what would have the backlash been if Vodafone had not launched Empesa? It would have been nothing, right? You don't get a bad media article or you don't get boycotted by customers for not coming up with an invention. Right? Because the media would have never thought that it was even possible to come up with this crazy idea of banking without a bank to begin with. But what is the backlash if you were to not be transparent about tax? It could be huge. And indeed, Vodafone themselves had suffered a series of boycotts because of its tax policy. So what is the purpose of me leading with these two stories? It's to give a different view of purposeful business to what we typically think. So often we think that a business which is purposeful is one that focuses on the second question. It's one that does no harm. It doesn't mistreat its workers. It doesn't pollute the environment. It doesn't um, cheat on taxes. And don't get me wrong, right, right, those things are important. We must ensure that a company treats society well. But what I'd like to do is to elevate our notion of purposeful business and focus on the first question. So a purposeful business is not just one that does no harm. It must actively do good, actively create value for society through a relentless commitment to excellence and innovation like Vodafone launching M-Pesa. So purpose is not just a risk management tool to avoid some scandals from mistreatment of workers. It's about positively creating value.
And so that goes to the framework that was mentioned in, in, in my book that um, Ronan talked about, which is hopefully going to be a nice framework for this talk as well, is that I view the value that a company creates as being represented by a pie. And that pie can either be given to investors in the form of profits or society in the form of value, and that's the orange. And that could be wages to workers, taxes to the government, fair prices or free services to customers. And we often think that responsibility or purpose is about a fair split of the pie. So moving from here to here would be seen as purposeful. And indeed, equality and fairness of distribution absolutely is really important. But you knew that before coming on this talk. So what I want to do is to elevate our thinking and highlight that a fair split is not enough for a company to be purposeful. And I think there's two limitations with viewing purpose as being only about a fair split of the pie. First problem is that, well, it reduces a company's profits. And so you might think, well, companies won't voluntarily want to pursue purpose if it makes it commercially less successful. And indeed, we see cases where maybe CEOs sign a business roundtable statement or make some nice purpose statements, but are accused of not genuinely putting it into practice. And you might think, well, why would they? Because if purpose means that the company is less profitable, then it's something that they will do to the minimum extent possible. But I think the second reason why we can't just view purpose as being about a different split of the pie is that it's bad for investors. Now, some people think, well, I don't really mind, because we often like to think that investors are nameless, faceless capitalists. Investors are them, society is us, and anything we can do to take from them and to give to us seems something which is appealing. But investors are not them. They are us. Right? They include parents saving for their children's education. They include pension funds saving for retirement. They include an insurance company funding future claims. So any repurposing of business needs to work for investors as well as wider society. It's not either or. It should be both and. And so that's why my view of a purposeful business is it's one that grows the pie. So absolutely, it is critical to increase the orange, to increase the value you give to society. But you do this not just by giving them a larger share of what's already there, maybe donating a lot to charity, but through innovation and excellence, coming up with new ways to solve social problems like Vodafone with M-Pesa. And the beauty of serving society through innovation and excellence rather than splitting of existing value is that ultimately investors will benefit, right? So even though m was genuinely launched to solve a social problem of financial inclusion, not to make money, ultimately Vodafone ended up being able to monetize it and also investors were better off. So that's why to conclude the first part of my talk, I define a purposeful business as one that seeks to create profits only through creating value for society. So let me quickly pick apart this definition, right? The final four words, create value for society, that's not controversial, but you probably already knew that before coming on this talk. But the first part is important. We want to create profits through creating value for society. So it's not just about redistribution of a fixed pie. We want to solve social problems, but in a way which is commercially viable. But also the important word is only because there are ways of creating profits without serving society, maybe price gouging customers or underpaying workers. So what we're viewing is profits as a byproduct of doing good for creating social value. Now, one important question is, is this actually different from the current approach to business? And you might think, well, isn't that a paradoxical question? Because isn't old approaches to business purely focused on profit rather than purpose? And the answer is actually no. Well, anybody who wants to attack the current approach to business will look at this statement 50 years ago, almost to this month, by Milton Friedman, which said the social responsibility of business is to increase profits. 
And it's almost got to a point that a requirement for acceptance into polite society is to argue just how wrong Friedman was, how narrow-minded he was, and how we need to think about a new way of running business. But it's important to recognise that actually Friedman's idea of being purely focused on profit is actually much less narrow-minded than you might think as long as you think about long-term profit. So why did he argue this? He said it was fine for a company to focus on long-term profit because the only way to be profitable in the long term is by treating stakeholders well. Right? You need to invest in your employees, otherwise they'll leave. You can't pollute the environment or your brand will be hurt and so forth. So even a pure focus on profits will get you to invest in stakeholders. So if so, well, why is purpose then so powerful why can't you just focus on profit and that will force you to care about society? Here is the fundamental difference, which is why I think purpose can be so powerful. Under a profit-centered approach, you will serve society, but only in an instrumental way to increase profits. So whenever you take a decision as a business, you will have some rough calculation as to whether this investment is going to hit the bottom line. And indeed, finance professors like me have taught this for the last 50 years. It's called net present value analysis. Right? If we are to build a new factory, we can calculate how many widgets that factory will produce, how much we can sell those widgets for, and then we can get the profits we're going to make. Compare that to the cost of the factory. If it's positive, we're going to go ahead. Now, that works for tangible investments like machines and factories. But in the 21st century, many of the key assets that a company has is intangible, such as its workforce. So if a company was to choose, let's say, to give greater parental leave to its employees, how could it do a calculation about that? Well, it could, in theory, try to calculate, yes, if we give more parental leave, then my workforce will be happier and more productive, and maybe they'd be more likely to stay. But there's no way of calculating that benefit. And if we indeed had this Friedman approach of having to justify every decision with a financial calculation, there would be many decisions that a company would not make, and ultimately it would be less profitable in the long term. So the power of purpose is that it's an intrinsic approach. So the reason why a company might want to invest in its employees is just because it's the right thing to do, because they will view its employees as human resources rather than human resources, and it will invest in them even if there is no explicit calculation of the impact that it has on financial value. And this shift in thinking of basing our decisions on purpose rather than calculations it's actually freeing. It frees up a company to make a lot of these long-term investments, which do pay off in form of profit in the long term. But because that payoff was so uncertain, it was something that you could not justify with a financial commitment, with a financial calculation to begin with. Now, clearly, it can't be a license to make all investments. We need to have some decision rule as to what investments to take or what to turn down. I'm going to come back to that later. But overall, this is the power of purpose. It frees us from justifying decisions with financial calculations. And instead, we do it because it's consistent with the company's mission. Now, at this point in the talk, you might think, well, what Alex says sounds good, but isn't it a bit too good to be true? Right? Where is the evidence for this? I'm trying to say, yes, let's make decisions with the idea of serving society. And then somewhat magically, profits will appear. But isn't this a bit wishful thinking? Where is the evidence? So this is the goal of me as a business school professor. Right? The idea of purpose is a very practitioner question. So you might think, well, why do academics have anything to add? But what our goal is, is to gather rigorous evidence in large scale to see whether purposeful companies actually perform better, or they might just be fluffy companies who are distracted from the bottom line. And the important thing about evidence is that it has to be rigorous and discerning. Why? Because of this problem of confirmation bias. So I'm sure people are familiar with this tendency, 
which is people will accept evidence if it confirms what you'd like to be true, and you'll reject evidence if it contradicts it. And I think that's a particular issue with purposeful business, because we'd like to live in a world in which purpose pays off. And so any study claiming that purposeful companies perform better, we might latch on to, even if that study is not really rigorous. And so this danger of confirmation bias is something I explored in a TED talk a couple of years ago called What to Trust in a Post-Truth World. I'm not going to go into this further, but this is just to highlight that with evidence, particularly on purpose, we need to be careful. And here's just one example of where caution might be necessary. So I'm taking Forbes, which is a publication I really respect. It had an article about a report saying that companies that ex excel in sustainability and responsibility outperform their peers financially. Nothing wrong with that statement. But here's the danger. Right, that is the report premise of a new report, and it is an accurate one. Judging by many conversations with those interested in better business and a sustainable future. So how does the journalist judge whether the report is accurate? Not by looking at the scientific rigor or the methodology, but by asking people who believe in purpose, do you think this report is correct? And obviously they would say that because they are predisposed to think about that. So what we wanted to do is to be much more rigorous in our view and in our study of the evidence. So this is something that I decided to study 15 years ago, in fact, before the purpose movement became big. So I wanted to look at, do purposeful companies actually perform better? Now, to do that, I needed a measure of a company's responsibility towards society. And this is difficult. You can't just look at a company's mission statement because they may have a nice statement but not put it into practice. So what I chose to look at is how a company treats its workers. So you might think, well, why do I focus on workers? There's the environment and customers. But I chose to focus on workers because I had a very good measure available. And that was the list of the 100 best companies to work for in America covered by Fortune magazine. So I think this list is good for, for two reasons. So the first is that it was available from 1984 so we have tons of measures of purpose. It's because purpose is a pretty new phenomenon. Many data sources have only been around since, say, 2010. And if I showed you that purpose paid off between 2010 and 2019, you might be sceptical. You might think, well, that was an economic upswing. Maybe purpose only pays off when the economy is doing well. Maybe in a pandemic, when money is tight, purpose is a luxury, and we shouldn't focus on it. So because my data started in 1984, I had things such as the financial crisis and the collapse of the internet bubble, so I could st study whether this was something which was robust. And the second reason why this was a good measure is it was really thorough. So it doesn't just look at quantitative factors like pay and benefits but it looks at qualitative factors like trust and management, pride in your job, and camaraderie with your colleagues. So I wanted to look at whether companies on this list do better in terms of long-term shareholder returns. Now that itself is tricky because as we know, correlation does not imply causation. So Google has been to, on the top of this list for, for many, many years, right? But Google has done really well. It could be for many other reasons not just employee satisfaction. So I had to do lots of further tests to isolate the effect of employee satisfaction. And as we know, it could be causality in either direction. Is it treating your employees well leads to better profit? Or is it once a company is profitable, then it can start treating its employees well? So I'm not going to bore you with all of the gory details as to how I disentangle this. That's in the paper itself. Instead, I want to get to the big bottom line for practitioners. And this is the following, is that I found that the 100 best companies to work for in America beat their peers by 2.3 to 3.8% per year over a 28-year period. So that's 89 to 184% cumulative. 
I don't think this should fundamentally change our view of our stakeholders, right? For away from the pie splitting mentality that anything that we give to stakeholders is at the expense of shareholders. Instead, investment in stakeholders grows the pie and ultimately shareholders will benefit. And while my study focuses on employees, there are other studies which look at other aspects such as customers or the environment or sustainability policy. So instead of going into more evidence, I want to spend my final 10 minutes or so on how do we put it into practice, right? This is an academic study, but what does it mean? And importantly, what does it mean for somebody at all levels of an organization, not just a CEO? So how do we think about purpose? Well, the first way to put it into practice is actually perhaps not to think about it at all. Right, because often when people think about purpose, they think about it as being something which is explicitly serving. So maybe if you're in the corporate social responsibility department and you're deciding which charity to donate to, you can think about purpose. But many people don't work in such departments. So, well, how can we serve and contribute to a company's purpose? Well, actually, in many cases, it's just through excellence. So simply by being excellent at what you do has a major impact upon society. So for example, Google, through bringing information together and making it accessible everywhere to everybody, that has even more effect on society than maybe donating to charity, even though that is also something which, which is helpful. Similarly, if you're a train company, just by making the trains run on time, that has a huge effect in keeping people connected to their jobs and families. That might be even more important than some of these non-core ancillary activities. So excellence in the core business is often the best form of service. And it means that almost all companies play a role in serving society. So if you're a train company, does this mean that you're not as uh, value adding as a pharmaceuticals company, which um, sells drugs and saves people's lives? No, you have a role in society and it's your goal to uh, pursue this role in the most excellent way possible. And similarly, this applies to all employees within a company. Right, because you might think, well, yes, if I'm in a pharmaceuticals company and I'm a scientist, I can see how my research and development adds value. But what if I'm in a procurement department? How can I connect with the organization's purpose? Well, what efficient procurement does is that it enables those companies' resources to achieve most bang for the buck and therefore allows these resources to be freed for investment in something such as R&D or in Google's case, in, in making information accessible for the world. And then you might be skeptical. You might think, well, what does excellence have to do with purpose, right? Shouldn't anybody try to be excellent? Even if your goal was to make as much money as possible, shouldn't we still strive for excellence? Well, not necessarily, right? So if you're a company which is run with shareholder value being the objective, you will only be excellent in things that have a clear link to financial performance. Indeed, in 2007, when Vodafone launched and Pazer, well, at the time, its main strategic priority was spectrum auctions, and it was trying to expand the market share within the West, which is where there was more lucrative um, customer bases. But instead, no, it thought about, well, how can we use our digital technology to serve wider society? Let's strive for excellence in that even though it's not clearly something which is profitable. Like somebody in my job as, as a professor, right, I believe that I add much more value to students through excellence in my teaching, through making sure it's relevant and not theoretical, but practical. That adds more value than the fact that I bike to my lectures rather than taking the Uber. And in, in, as a professor, what right, you are rewarded almost exclusively on your research, because that's what gets you tenure and promotion, Teaching is not rewarded, but if you're someone who's driven by purpose as a professor, this is something where you might aim for excellence, even though there's no clear, tangible or instrumental payoff. It's instead the intrinsic desire to create and disseminate knowledge. What about the second thing in terms of putting it into practice? What I want to do now is to filter down and funnel in on what purpose actually means. Because the word purposeful is often viewed as a synonym for altruistic, right? A purposeful company 
is one that serves wider society. And so some companies will have a purpose like this. It's to serve customers, workers, suppliers, the environment, communities, and investors. That sounds great because you're serving everybody. But that's not what purpose is about. Right? If we think semantically, the word purposeful means focused and targeted. Right? A purposeful meeting is one with a clear agenda. If I do something on purpose, then I do it deliberately. So I think purpose is not about being all things to all people, but knowing exactly what is the way that you serve society. And this is, I think, the main thing that some leaders might misunderstand about purpose. They might think, well, it is a company's job to solve all of the world's problems, right? We have many issues right now, automation, diversity, the coronavirus, climate change, and so on. It might seem overwhelming for a company to have to deal with them all. You might think we need to tick every box. But that is not your responsibility. It's to focus on the social problems that you are best placed to solve and to do this in a targeted way. So I view purpose as why an enterprise exists, who it serves, its reason for being, and the role that it plays in the world. And there's two aspects for it. There's why you exist. And I say that this should be based on your comparative advantage. So what are your resources and expertise? What are the problems that you are best placed to solve? And the second is who you exist for, which is what I call something should be driven by materiality. And because there's a lot of other talks about the why, and because I want to make sure there's enough time for questions, I'm only going to be focusing on the who. So what do I mean by materiality? Well, going back to the who, what there's many different stakeholders that a company can serve. Customers, workers, suppliers, the environment and communities. But there will always be trade-offs. Right? Some decisions help some stakeholders and hurt others. So if you are an energy company and you close down a polluting plant, that will help the environment, but it's going to make some workers redundant. So to say you're going to serve everybody, that's not going to help you in navigating that trade-off. But instead, if we think about the who, right, what materiality says is that there's going to be particular stakeholders that are even more material to my business. So they are the first among equals. And then when there is a difficult trade off, I'm going to be somebody who I'm going to try to side. I'm going to place even more attention to those material stakeholders. And that's going to link to the final study that I'm, I'm showing, which is this one here. So. What this looks at is the Sustainability Accounting Standards Board materiality map. So what this goes is it goes industry by industry and highlights who are the most material stakeholders. So if we look at the first column, if you're in minerals processing and extractive, the environment is material because of your huge impact. But what about the financials? Well, maybe the environment is not as important as social capital, so selling practices and product labeling, customer privacy and data security, right? Because it might mean that even though climate change is clearly a really important issue, maybe a bank adds even more value to society by ensuring that its selling practices and product labeling are absolutely fair and transparent. We don't want to be in, say, a fake bank account scandal or mis-selling payment protection insurance. And what this study found was it looked at companies with high ESG, environmental, social, and governance ratings from MSCI, perhaps the best known data source, and companies that did well across the board actually did not beat the market. They only beat the market by one and a half percent per year, which was insignificant. But when the, when the authors then redid this, looking at companies that did well on every issue, or did well on only the material issues, and then scale back on the immaterial ones, they did beat the market by 4.83%. So it's worth pausing to highlight the significance of this result, why it's better for a company to do well on only a few things than to do well on everything. And so this highlights why how purpose is not a license for anything goes. It doesn't mean we're a free for all. It means that we're going to focus on the particular problems that we are uniquely placed to solve and affect our most material stakeholders. 
And that's going to take me to my final part, I'm going to, which is on, well, how do we think about purpose within the coronavirus crisis? But there's been some companies which have done some amazing actions in the pandemic to serve wider society. And these are about splitting the pie differently. So some executives are working for nothing. Um, some are continuing to pay their workers if they're furloughed. And some are helping out their customers. So Unilever is giving 100 million euros of um, food and sanitizer to society. Now, those are amazing examples. Any company that's done that should be widely praised. But the problem with viewing purpose as being about pie splitting is not every company can split the pie. So not every company might have 100 million euros to give out. Or maybe you're not in the food and sanitizer industry. So this is why I started my talk with the importance of purpose as being about growing the pie. Right, thinking innovatively and pursuing excellence, thinking about what is in your hand, what are the resources that my company has, and how can I think creatively about how we can use this to serve society? And so just to think about some of the ways that Google has done that, right, its expertise is in information to provide things such as to work with the NHS to give access to NHS information, that's the National Health Service within the UK, to work on contact tracing systems and so forth, to give, say, digital skills training to people. Those are ways which are using your comparative advantage rather than swinging the wind and responding to whatever social problem happens to be the order of the day. So this is indeed consistent with purpose, being about focused and being targeted. Okay, so just before questions, um, I, I just, as Ronan highlighted, I just wrote a book on this called Grow the Pie, how great companies deliver both purpose and profit, which might be of interest to people wanting to read further. And what made me write this book is I think for too long, people had viewed purpose as being something ancillary, something to be delegated to a CSR department, something which was not a CEO level issue. But I wanted to highlight that it's not just something worthy, but something fundamental, which is based on a company's long-term success. So I come from this as a finance professor. Sometimes finance is the enemy of purpose, thinking that it's actually a distraction from the bottom line. But I wanted to show that it's financially important as well. And this is also based not on just wishful thinking, but a lot of rigorous evidence. But often this evidence is written in a pretty technical and academic way, what I wanted to do was to make it accessible for a practitioner audience and bring it to life with some examples and frameworks. So I hope this might be of interest to people um, interested in reading about purpose further. Well, thank you so much for the attention and, the, and also for the um, invitation. Let me hand back over to Ronan to moderate the Q&A. Alex, thank you very much for that. Um, I feel a renewed pr pressure to be both excellent and purposeful in all that I do, um, but really insightful, thank you. Um, I've, I've got a couple of questions I'd like to ask you, and then we'll uh, see if we have any from the other folks who are listening in. And maybe to, to start with a, with a very macro question, because I can see situations where very often the desire to uh, do good and follow purpose can be at odds with the pressures on profitability in the short term. And you know, you've looked at a lot of companies. How do companies make that trade off successfully? Mm -hmm. uh, because sometimes the uh, pressure from investors will be about, you know, this quarter, next quarter, this year, and trying to convince that a big payoff might come in many years time uh, can be tough. How are, how are they approaching that? I think yours is a really key question about horizons, because while I said being purposeful does grow the pie, it only grows the pie in the long term. So in the short term, investing in your employees splits the pie differently, it reduces your profits. And indeed, in my study, I found it took four to five years before it fully was incorporated into the stock price. So I think there's two things which are critical. And the first is reporting. So a lot of companies are now moving away from just financial reporting to what is known as integrated reporting to highlight its purpose metrics. It will try to set particular non-financial targets and, and report its progress in, um, in accordance with them. And it's more to stress that um, reporting and discussing with your investors needs to be more than just reports, but actually in-person meetings. Because the problem with just um, quantitative numbers is you can do what's known as hit the target, 
but miss the point, right? So you could pay your workers a lot, but not really focus on the qualitative dimensions such as corporate culture, which are harder to measure. So I think one good example is, is Unilever. So sorry to bring them up again, but what was really interesting is when they launched the Sustainable Living Plan, they said, we're going to look at our progress and report this, but we're going to meet our shareholders and tell them what's beyond the numbers and how we're doing. And so when Kraft came in, and made the takeover bid for Unilever, normally in a takeover situation, the company needs to defend themselves. But instead, it was actually investors who came to Unilever's rescue, and they themselves were saying in the media, no, we don't think that this valuation incorporates the true value of Unilever's business, because they had um, been communicated this through all of the meetings and, and, and the reporting. And I think the second thing we need to think about is the reward structure of executives, because it is still the case that some executives are paid according to short term profit measures. So regardless of what they say, there's skepticism as to whether they're going to put it into practice. So one of the things I particularly focus on is the reform of pay. Now, many people, when they talk about pay being reformed, they look at the level of pay or the quantum. But I think that's based on the pie splitting idea that anything the CEO gets is at the expense of everybody else. When it's not, it could be because she's created a lot of value. Instead, I think the key thing is to make sure that CEO is rewarded to, for, let's say, five or seven year performance, because then that gives them the incentives for these long term actions and overcomes the horizon problem. Great. Now, I feel very fortunate that we work at uh, Google. We've always had purpose at the heart of what we do. And um, uh, Ruth, our CFO, always talks about the fact that we have long-term horizons on many of our bets, and we spend time talking to our investors and stakeholders about that. But it strikes me that you can quickly get into a situation where there's many different opportunities to pursue purpose, that you can they can overlap in many ways. And what are the strategies you see that are successful for people to 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 figure that out and figure out which purposes they're going to pursue because quickly you could end up in too many directions with a very confusing story. Yeah, so I think this is why um, both materiality and comparative advantage are really critical because they highlight, well, is my does my company have unique expertise in order to solve this problem? And so this is why I know I've used the example of charitable donations in the past, but I think it's instructive because many people view um, corporate philanthropy as a key element for, for purpose. Like when Mr. Floyd was killed and then pe companies were giving a, a lot of money to Black Lives Matter, and obviously racial diversity is something I, I really care about. But actually, does a company have a comparative advantage in doing that rather than donating to charity they could pay higher wages to workers or higher dividends to investors and they could choose to support whatever charity they want to support so maybe for some it's racial diversity but for others it might be say climate change or it might be cancer research so a company doesn't have a uh, expertise in that but instead if we think about our ancillary actions as being ones that uniquely use our specific expertise so it might be digital garage for, for for google then that's something which which is really helping us but i think a useful question is to say to think about purpose is as much about knowing what not to do as what to do because otherwise you have this this problem that we've only got certain resources and certain amount of, of time so if we want to pursue certain things well it has to be we're going to choose to scale back on others and just recognize well that's not my company's unique expertise in doing that for example for me because i like really to, to interact with companies and investors i need to scale back on the purely academic conferences that i'm doing and i need to make a conscious decision to turn down those invitations now i do want to get kind of move away from the the macro corporate thing in a minute but um one one more question on that i mean the numbers seem to be very uh, uh very strong and with also so much discussion in the media about the need for everybody to take action on a whole range of different matters why is every company not already out there and pursuing a very clear purpose agenda mm. Thanks for this. And I think that this is also in, in, in David's question, which he's asking, which is, if clear purpose makes good business, why aren't more companies focusing on it? It just seems obvious. So I think there's a, there's a couple of, of things. So I think one of is, is that some of the initial studies on purpose were, were quite flimsy. So they weren't trying to address correlation and causation. And so it works a little like vaccination. So vaccination is if you put a weak form of the pathogen in, then your body is really strongly reacting into it. And so there might be business leaders who think, oh, no, this 
this is just the purpose camp again with their doctored studies, which is why I wanted to come at this from a rational, hard-hearted finance perspective and still show that this is something that, that pays off. I think the second thing is that the evidence for purpose is actually quite nuanced. So it's not the case that every purpose dimension matters. We do need to think about things like materiality. And that is uncomfortable because to say, well, some stakeholders matter more than others is not something that a leader would like to acknowledge. You'd like to say you care about everybody. But actually, the evidence doesn't show that companies that indiscriminately add value to society do well. And, and some of the examples is let's go back to the pay idea because that's something which is a lot in the media. People will focus on the pay ratio and they'll look at a company with a low CEO to worker pay ratio as being purposeful. And they'll think, well, this is something which is going to lead to long term profits because it means that you're more equal and fair. The actual evidence shows the opposite to that. But because of confirmation bias, because it's easy to, um, to proclaim that, well, fairness and equality pays off then this myth has sort of pervaded. And so that's why some investors, which invest with that as being an investment criterion, don't actually do well in the long term. So if you look at the evidence, ESG funds don't typically beat the market. Why? Because some of them might be using the wrong ESG dimensions, which is why I do think it's really important to have an evidence-based approach to uh, being a purposeful business. Great. Uh, and a related question from Anna Maria that I see here is the role for governments and um, have you seen examples of governments playing a positive role in encouraging companies to pursue these purpose-driven um, uh, objectives? Unfortunately, I haven't. So, so I, I do think there's a large role for governments to play in terms of purposeful business. And this might be, for example, to internalise externalities through something such as a carbon tax and so forth, for regulation to force disclosure of things such as um, carbon emissions and so on. However, the problem with government regulation is that it's one size fits all. It's very difficult for regulation to take comparative advantage into account because that is very company specific. So rather than answering your question in a positive way, I'm afraid I'll give you a negative example. So in India, for example, they give this rule that companies must give 2% of their profits to corporate social responsibility initiatives. And that's something which doesn't take comparative advantage into account. Right? You could satisfy that requirement by just um, giving the money in anything, even if it's something that doesn't have comparative advantage, so your company is not achieving a high bang for buck. So this is why I like to, to have this um, business-based commercial approach to this by saying, well, it's in your business's interest to think about comparative advantage. It's not something that we can regulate. So certainly regulation is useful. I'm not a strong free market. I think regulation needs to make these externalities clear, make information clear. But regulation is like a referee or an umpire of a sports game. You set the rules, but then you allow people to play because then the tennis player can choose whether they want to use slice or topspin, whatever he or she is good at. And that's a similar case for, for companies. Great. Now, we have a couple of questions from Eric. Uh, and first and foremost, where can we find the paper with all the details on your methodology and he's also in kind of related question i think about how your study demonstrates the direction of causality i'm really glad that you're asking this because you should be skeptical because otherwise this is something the message i've given is something that people might be willing to accept without scrutiny so you must scrutinize anything i say as you would anybody else so um on my website alexedmonds.com i put all my research papers available so there is a research subsection there and it's a paper which was published in the 2011 Journal of Financial Economics, which is one of the leading academic journals, and that goes into the methodology. But let me just describe this in, in a couple of minutes so you don't have to delve into the gory details of the paper and the Butch and Barbaric equations. So what I look at is, is a stock returns of a company. So why is that important? If I looked at just profits, I would face that causality issue. If I found that companies with high employee satisfaction were more profitable, it could be employee satisfaction causes profits, or it could be that profits cause employee satisfaction because you can spend money on training your workers. Now, the beauty about stock returns is that the stock return is the change in the stock price from now to next year. Right. So if indeed causality was in the wrong direction, that a company had high employee satisfaction because it was already profitable, then the starting point would already be high and it wouldn't outperform going forwards. 
Now you might think, well, doesn't that assume that the stock market is efficient? The stock market is already taking profitability into account, but I can control for that. There's something known as momentum, which takes into account the fact that the stock market is uh, slow to react to some things. So by looking at future stock returns and controlling for the current stock price, that is a way of making sure that a company's current financial health is not something which is driving the results. Thank you. Now, not all of us um, get to set the mission and purpose and direction of a company. And uh, certainly most of us listening in today don't have that luxury at Google. So how do you then take this concept and embed it further down into organizations in a way that's successful? And how can I, as a, you know, a, a leader of a small part of Google's business, think about just our little corner of Google and then think about purpose and creating that same uh, enthusiasm for it within that group. Thanks. I think this is critical because you often think, well, okay, purpose is great in the other C-suite, but if I'm just a small cog in a big wheel, then I really kind of change things. So let me give one of my own practical examples. So I used to have a proper job once. It was in Morgan Stanley, a very large organization. And I thought, well, I'm right at the bottom of the ladder. I can't do anything in order to try to change um, the atmosphere. Nobody works for me. But actually, I realized that some people did work for me, right? Not any bankers, but there was the IT department, there was the um, support staff, there was the print room, and perhaps one of the most mistreated departments, it was known as created ser creative services or graphics. So what you would do as an analyst, you would give them a PowerPoint presentation with a few markups and you'd ask them to implement the changes. And often it would be that analysts would be angry and shout at them because they didn't do what you said, even if it was your fault for not explaining it. So there were times where I got a really good a job back from creative services. I called them up and I said, hi, this is Alex. You just did the job for me. Um, could you tell me who it was? And they said, well, it was Juliet. And I said, well, can you put me through to Juliet? And they did. And I said, hi, Juliet, this is Alex. You just did a job for me. It was excellent in all of these ways. And by the way, I didn't even ask you to do this thing, but you did it as well. Now, I didn't do this in any ostensible way, um, but it just so happened that because I was so junior, I didn't have my own office where right? I was in the open plan floor. And then other analysts heard me and then they having these conversations, they thought, well, why don't I just do this myself? And so what was really surprising was that even though I was the lowest rank in the organization, because these things spread, right, then you can affect, I didn't clearly affect the whole company, but the small segment of, of the organization that I was in. So what I highlight in chapter 10 of the book is the power of what I call agency. Like we often think that people are powerless because corporations are so, so large, but actually I think now more than ever, why individual citizens have a huge impact on business and wider society, perhaps because of social media and, and, and organizations such as Google. Because what we saw in the pandemic is that we heard that some of our friends were doing grocery shopping for the elderly neighbors. That helped us to do th the same. And, and so we can see these small actions having a ripple effect. So the phrase I'm gonna use now is, is a bit corny, but I do like it. It's to be the thermostat not the thermometer, right? A thermometer reflects the temperature of what's around you, a thermostat affects it. And again, you might think there's this wishful thinking and too good to be true, but I don't think so, right? We have seen in the pandemic, a lot of selfless behavior. It wasn't that everybody used to be selfish and now has become selfless. It's indeed, I think a few acts of a couple of people, let's say Captain Sir Tom Moore, right, have just ignited the latent selflessness within us. And I think it will, might be the same within large organizations, even if you're somebody who's a relatively junior person. I love that idea about being the thermostat and not the thermometer. And uh, Alex, has it always been that way for you? It strikes me that even back in your uh, uh, days at Morgan Stanley, that this drive towards excellence and kind of positive impact, even in the little things around you has always been, uh, it's always been there. When did you first realize that this was something that had a bigger story to it? Thanks. I think it was just trying to, I know it's a, it's a lot of a cliche, but it's just to love what you do. So if you indeed choose, choose to go into a particular profession, why right, it's something that uh, you love doing. And so even if it's something with no extrinsic reward, then you're going to do this. So clearly with investment banking, there's a lot of great extrinsic reasons to, to go into it. But I, I genuinely liked finance and economics. This might seem nerdy, but because my, my dad was an accountant, 
I like the fact that, let's say, unlike physics, where there is one right answer, a social science is something where you have some evidence, so you're not swinging in the wind, but you can have different viewpoints on this. So I always like the fact that you can look at data and have different opinions. That's why I went into that career. And that's why, like, for me now, right, I know that purpose is sort of a really hot topic and a lot of talking heads like to jump on the bandwagon and, and write about that, because this is something I've looked at my entire career. So for me, it's not just a topic of academic study that gets published in, in, in journals, but it's something that I, I personally really really care about and that's why it's it's fantastic to get this opportunity to, to talk to a company which has also been one which has been driven by purpose from day one I, as i'd say it's you driven by purpose before it became cool and that would be I, i'd say the same for myself so do you sit down every day now and check every decision against your purpose framework to make sure that you're headed in the right direction how pervasive has it become and how you make your day-to-day -day, uh, uh, choices yeah, you know, I actually used to do that. And it might seem really mechanistic, but one of my favourite books is this book, Seven Habits of Highly Effective People by Stephen Covey. And he has, um, I think it's Habit 2, which is Begin with the End in Mind. And he had a, says, come up with a personal mission statement, which is like an individual's analogue of a company's purpose. So for me, I defined it as to use rigorous research to influence the practice of business that was the professional part. And the second part was to inspire others to fulfill their potential. And so I would read this every morning to make sure that when I was doing my research, it was to influence the practice of business rather than just being intellectually interesting. And then if I was to do um, purposeful personal stuff, it was to inspire others. So when I was a professor at Wharton, people would, uh, charities would come to me and say, oh, could you serve on this charity board always as a treasurer because I was a nerdy finance person? But I would typically say no. So the only thing I did in terms of my, my charity was stuff was I was the head coach of the American Cancer Society. So people who were running marathons, I would coach them because that had the inspiration aspect of my purpose statement, whereas running spreadsheets wasn't part of that. And yes, at the start, it seemed very mechanistic. I'd remind myself of this. Now I don't, but that's because it, I think it's sufficiently internalized. I think it's the same, like go back to your ten my tennis analogy, right? When you first play, you think to hit a forehand, I need to steps on the side, I need to have a backswing and follow through. But then after a point in time, this should hopefully be something which is ingrained in you. And so um, now I, I try to use less rules. Hopefully it's something which I will just take the, these actions naturally. And I think the very purposeful companies like, like your own will just do this because it's ingrained in the culture. That's why culture is so powerful. And that's why it trumps following rules and procedures. Alex, I think that's a wonderful note to end on. You've given us some great inspiration around uh, what it looks like to be working for a great company um, and what are the things that we can do in our own little corner of that company and indeed in our personal lives to keep that purpose uh, at the center of what drives us. So really appreciate you taking uh, the time to be with us again today. And for everybody else who's listening, uh, the book uh, that is behind Alex's talk today, Grow the Pie, and how great companies deliver both purpose and profit. Uh, and hopefully we'll be doing both for a long time to come. Alex, really appreciate you spending the time with us. Thanks so much, Ronan. Thanks, Jonathan. It's great to be here. Appreciate the invitation. Thank you.